Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Hewitt podcast available every morning on Apple, Spotify or wherever you listen. It's Thursday the 9th of May here in London. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, the Bank of England weighs when to cut interest rates after the Fed pushes its move down the road. President Biden warns that the US will hold back more weapons if Israel invades Rafa. Plus, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We have the inside story on who might one day succeed Tim Cook at the tech titan. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. Markets are poised for a stronger signal on when the Bank of England will cut interest rates. Although economists expect the benchmark rate to stay at five and a quarter percent, Governor Andrew Bailey may provide clearer indications later on when he expects to loosen policy. Bloomberg's chief UK economist Dan Hansen says more MPC members could be warming to a cut. For me, actually, what's been most interesting is what policymakers have been saying. And we've had remarks from certainly Andrew Bailey and Dave Ramsden that are, you know, very much sort of moving in, I would say, the dovish direction. There's a little bit of uncertainty, I think, about what Hugh Pill did or didn't say in his speech. But I think the thing for us that we took away, at least, is that there he said that there's been little news in the data, which is obviously clearly very important. That's Dan Hansen from Bloomberg Economics. Policymakers also face some political pressure to lower borrowing costs as government ministers look for a feel-good factor for voters ahead of an election expected later this year. The latest Bank of England decision is due at 12pm UK time, followed by a press conference led by Andrew Bailey. Now, the former chief economist of the Bank of England says that he was denied a British bank account last year because he was designated politically connected. Referring to the debanked politician Nigel Farage, Andy Haldane says, we are all Nigels now. More than 140,000 companies have been debanked across the UK, including me. So um, I tried to open a bank account last year and the bank was very nice, very straightforward process. It came back a few weeks later refusing and they said your account's been refused because you are politically connected by dint of working for the Bank of England. Andy Haldane speaking there at the Royal Society of Arts, where he's now CEO. Haldane blamed regulation like Basel III and Solvency II for chilling risk appetite and stalling investment. He argues the UK needs to take more gambles if it wants to boost growth, offering a partial endorsement of shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves' securonomics policies. U.S. President Joe Biden says he will stop additional shipments of offensive weapons to Israel if the country goes ahead with a ground invasion of Rafah in Gaza. The comments come as the U.S. paused delivery of about 3,500 bombs to Israel that could cause massive collateral damage in the densely packed city. In an interview with CNN, Joe Biden sought to highlight the potential loss of civilian life if Benjamin Netanyahu's government opts to invade the area. They go into Rafah. I'm not supplying the weapons that have been used historically to deal with Rafah, to deal with the cities, to deal with that problem. We're going to continue to make sure Israel is secure in terms of Iron Dome and their ability to respond to attacks like came out of the uh, Middle East recently. But it's, uh, it's, it's just wrong. Biden's decision on arms supplies was attacked by Israel, who reportedly told US officials that pressure should be put on Hamas rather than on their country. Shares in the chip designer Arm tumbled after a lukewarm forecast. Revenue for fiscal 2025 is expected to be $3.8 billion to $4.1 billion. Now, that is just shy of analysts' expectations of $4 billion on the lower end. Kunshan Sabani from Bloomberg Intelligence says the slowdown is sector-wide. The driver for the slight miss in the fiscal year guidance was coming really from two major areas. One is networking and the other is the industrial IoT, which uh, most of the semiconductor companies exposed to this are seeing weakness here. So that's not company specific. It's just that end market is going through a cyclical bottom. There's higher inventories and the demand is weak. Bloomberg's semiconductor analyst Kunshan Sabani speaking there. The predictions raise concerns that the tech industry's artificial intelligence spending spree is slowing. But ARM CEO Rene Haas says that the company remains very confident in its long-term growth. 
London is missing out on a rebound in Europe's initial public offering market, according to new data compiled by Bloomberg. Of the $11.9 billion raised in IPOs in Europe this year, just over 2% was in the UK. That compares to an average share of 31% over the past 11 years. With UK stocks trading at a discount to many foreign markets, it's believed that the London IPO market is being hindered by the prospect of higher valuations elsewhere. A UK think tank says that Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has run out of fiscal room. The National Institute for Economic and Social Research says weak growth and sticky inflation mean the government will need to raise taxes in the autumn rather than cut them. Bloomberg's Tiwa Adebayo has more. There were already question marks about whether tax cuts could really restore the Conservative Party's election hopes. But NISA say not only can the Chancellor not afford them, government deficits are so far into the red zone he will need to raise taxes just to balance the books. Their advice? Scrap the fiscal rules entirely and bring in a longer-term system that allows more public investment. There is brighter news in the report. NISA expects a 6% surge in living standards this year as inflation moderates. In London, Tiwa Adebayo, Bloomberg Radio. Now in a moment we'll look ahead to today's Bank of England decision and also speak to Bloomberg's chief correspondent Mark Gurman, staying up very late for us in the US to talk about who might succeed Tim Cook at Apple. But also I just wanted to reflect for a moment on Andy Haldane's speech. I mean he's a hugely influential economist of course here in the UK and I think across Europe as well, a former chief economist at the Bank of England. Um, and his speech, you know, talking about everyone being a Nigel... Look, this will get pick up, right, um, in terms of the UK media being debanked. Um, but I think that some of his speech was absolutely fascinating. He talked about why stability and stasis is not enough, not enough for the UK or for the world, that actually globally we need to take more risks, that there's so much anxiety about change, it's causing us not to change rapidly enough. And this is absolutely, I think, where the conversation is, the kind of zeitgeist at the moment. He talked about the stagnation in wages in the UK over the past 15 years, but he compared that to the United States where he talked about 50 years of wage stagnation. And yet he was also very optimistic. He said he didn't want to be all you know, doom and gloom. That wasn't his term. But he, he said that he wanted to uh, focus on the optimism and where there are opportunities, that global trade is still growing, um, that levels of income around the world have never been sort of higher, that people are living longer. And that is a huge opportunity for this century. So there was a lot of kind of optimism in his speech. Look, it's always very interesting to listen to what Andy Haldane has to say, not only because of his past position at, at the Bank of Eng- up at the Bank of England, but also um, his views on where policy goes now mm. as well. We we had him on the Bloomberg UK Politics podcast just a couple of months ago, um, and I'd point you back to that episode as well if you want to hear more from Andy Haldane's views. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right, let's turn our attention then. Well, remaining with the Bank of England, shall we? It's expected to keep lending rates at five and a quarter percent, but the question is whether Governor Andrew Bailey gives stronger signals on when the central bank can lower those borrowing costs from their highest in 16 years. Joining us now, Jamie Rush, our chief European economist. Good morning, Jamie. The rate path and the signals from Andrew Braley, what do you expect? What about the potential vote split at the Bank of England? Well, as we know, like, traders are fairly split on whether there's going to be a cut in June, and so today could well be quite decisive in tilting that price in one way or another. On on the vote split and the and the communications around that, uh, I think to, to see a cut, we're going to need a couple, to see a couple of things. Possibly one of the members of the committee deciding to cut, whereas previously they've decided that they've been on hold. So as you, I mean, Dave Ramson would be a good candidate for that because he now sees inflation risks in the UK as being to the downside, which is a change of position. So we should probably expect him to favour a cut. Uh, and then we'll also need to see that backed up by some dovish remarks from Bailey. Some of the data have been surprisingly strong, like inflation's a little bit strong, services inflation certainly is a little stronger. Um, the economy is growing a little faster. So we need to see some evidence that they're not panicking as that as that data has come through um, and that'll probably be enough but I mean if you want to a wild card I mean they could explicitly say that they're minded to ease if the data come in and line with their forecast and that, I, we don't think they'll do that because they're they're expressly data dependent but it's a possibility and if they want to send a strong message that's that's how they'll do it. 
What about the the forecasts for inflation and growth? What will you be watching out for? Well, again, I think that I mean the forecasts are always a, a tool to communicate to markets about whether they're they're thinking the same way. So last time they produced a forecast, there was a hundred basis points of cuts uh, in the in the yield curve, and inflation was roughly in line with target in the medium term. This time, there's only 50 basis points of cuts in the in the forecast, probably. And so they'll probably show that inflation is below target in the medium term, which is to say that markets are too hawkish and that they should uh, they should they should expect more easing. OK, um, what is in, in terms of the, the other stories that we're thinking about? The think tank NISA has weighed in on on tax cuts. I mean, uh, there's also potentially in the backdrop some pressure on the Bank of England's cut rates. You know, that would be a good thing for the government and so on. NISA, which is, again, a think tank in the UK, they um, have forecasts which are very similar to the model used by the Treasury. And they show that any pre-election giveaway by the Chancellor in terms of tax cuts wouldn't be possible that actually Hunt has to do more in terms of balancing the books. Well, so I think there's there's a couple of points on this one. I mean, the first is that there wasn't room to do tax cuts last time um, because the only way that they're, they're consistent with debt falling at the end of the forecast is by penciling in ludicrously tight spending settlements for government departments. So there, there was never any room to do tax cuts anyway. But if you if you take them at their, at their, at their word that they're going to do these spending cuts, then, yeah, it's probably it's, it's reasonably likely that they'll have less space uh, when it comes to the next fiscal event. But what I would say, though, is that spending taxes are two huge numbers and the difference between them can be quite can be quite small, or at least changes in those numbers. It's basically impossible to forecast exactly where the OBR is going to land, regardless of which model you have. It comes down to what the OBR's judgments are. It's the people who run the OBR who are making decisions about how how strong the economy is going to be. A model can't tell you that. So I, I think there's it, we should probably be a bit sceptical about whether the, 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 we're able to predict um, where the OBR is going to land in the end. OK, Jamie, thank you so much. Our Chief Europe Economist there from Bloomberg Economics, Jamie Rush, talking us through uh, today's decision from the Bank of England. Now, it's a huge tech job and a dilemma. Who will succeed Tim Cook as Apple's next CEO? Bloomberg's Mark Gurman has a long piece looking at Cook's tenure and the growing questions about who might follow him, leading a multi-trillion dollar company. And it's all in Bloomberg Business Week. But Mark joins us now. Good morning, Mark. Thank you so much for staying up so late and speaking to us. Apple as a business has quite a lot to grapple with right now. It's a busy time for Apple. Obviously, you're grappling with the everlasting search for a new innovative product after the iPhone. You're grappling with the European Union and the United States, with which both want to break up the App Store, which, by the way, generates $20 billion a year in revenue as smartphone sales are slowing. You're trying to pull some of your manufacturing out of China while also trying to not upset Beijing. So clearly, Tim Cook is very busy right now. He's got a lot on his plate. But like you said, there are questions about succession at Apple, given that Cook is turning 65 next year. And he's certainly rich enough to retire. So who could be in the running to replace Tim Cook? Yeah, Cook, of course, like the rest of Apple's executive team, they're all rich and old enough to retire. But money isn't necessarily the focus. They appreciate the power, right? They appreciate the product work the business side of it, right? So it's not all about the money for them. If it was, they would have retired by now. So who is next in line? Well, if Tim Cook were to step down in the very near future, look no further than Jeff Williams. He's Apple's chief operating officer. He was named to that role nine years ago. That was the same role that Tim Cook held for many years under Steve Jobs. He's in charge of both industrial and user interface design at Apple, the company's supply chain and Apple Care, And he not only looks like Tim Cook, not only went to the same school as Tim Cook and also like Cook worked at IBM, uh, but he is Cook's number two. The other part of it is that he's only two years younger than Cook. That's a problem. If Cook steps down uh, in five, seven years or so, Mm -hmm. you can't pass the baton to Williams. He's going to be pushing 67, 70 years old. You can't name a person of that age as brilliant and as wise as they may be as a CEO and expect them to be in the role for 15 years like Cook and Jobs before him. That leaves us with someone else. That's John Turnus, the senior VP of hardware engineering. 
Okay, that's interesting. Um, as you say, I mean, the, the circle around Tim Cook has remained very tight for, for many years. I mean, is it still your view that the succession would come internally rather than externally? Yeah, my strong view is that the succession will happen internally. And I do strongly believe that John Turnus, like I said, the head of hardware engineering, uh, is the next person up to be the CEO of Apple. He's about 48, 49 years old, which means he's about 15 young, years younger than Cook. If Cook steps down in the next five years or so, that will leave pretty long runway for Turnus to imprint his image on the company. He comes from the hardware engineering side, so that would be unique and new for the company. Mm. The previous CEO, obviously, Cook is an operations-focused executive. And Turnus's biggest challenge, because I think Cook will deal with the smartphone and the China issues uh, and the regulatory matters before his tenure is over, will be finding that next big product okay. category for the company. And so it makes sense to have a hardware person do that. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business app and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.